All right, welcome to section 4.4. And section 4.4, we're going to be looking at something called an indeterminate form. Or at least revisiting indeterminate forms. And we're going to be looking at something called the Hospital's rule. as well. All right. So um, we've actually looked at indeterminate forms before. So let me um, take or um, remind you of what that looks like. Essentially, an, uh, an indeterminate form is when we have 0 over 0. So for instance, if we were trying to take the limit, of x squared plus 5x plus 6 over x plus 2. Um, if you're we trying to take that limit at negative 2, well, when we plug in the negative 2, we see that it's 0 over 0. All right, and then that means we cannot take the limit by substitution. We can only take the limit by substitution if we're continuous at negative 2. Um, but what our strategy has been before this is that if it is 0 over 0, it means there's probably some algebraic manipulation we could do where we can cancel the factor that's making the top and the bottom 0. And that was our strategy up until this point. So for instance, x squared plus 5x plus 6 factors as x plus 2x plus 3. And now we see that factor that's making the top and the bottom zero, All right? And we can come along and we can cancel it out. Um, so that uh, original rational expression reduces down to x plus three with a domain restriction, x isn't allowed to be negative two. But remember for limits, we don't care what happens at negative two, it's uh, what happens around negative two, okay? So we can actually use this um, by substituting in x equals negative 2. And so this limit ends up being 1. All right, and then that's a demonstration of the indeterminate form. When we look at 0 over 0, we call it indeterminate. Um, also, when we have something like infinity divided by infinity, these are indeterminate forms. Okay, um, and we've seen tons of examples up until this point. We even have had to define something for one of our trig functions. We've defined that sine x over x. When we take the limit as x approaches 0, it's equal to 1. And we proved this um, using numerical experimentation. If you remember way back in the day, like chapter 2 type of stuff, we, there's a quick little proof using um, geometry as a proof. Um, and then we're gonna show we're gonna show another way to prove this. But essentially, if we were to plug in that x equals zero, sine zero over zero is is zero over zero. So again, we get that indeterminate form. Okay, so um, we have some ways to go about taking the limit for these indeterminate forms, right? We can factor like we did this. We have some trig properties that even though it's indeterminate, we know it's going to tend towards one. But look at this one. What if we were to have something a little bit more complicated, like the limit as x approaches 2 of the natural log of 2x minus 3 um, over x minus 2? Okay, and if we were to plug in x equals 2, you know, we have the natural log of 4 minus 3 is 1, and 2 minus 2, and the natural log of 1, or the logarithm of 1, regardless of the base, this is saying, you know, e to what power is 1, well, e to the 0 is 1. Okay, so we're getting that indeterminate form 0 over 0. But the problem is, going back to our original function, what kind of algebraic manipulation can we do? None. 
there's nothing we could do to simplify that expression. So if we wanted to take that limit, there has to be another way, okay? And luckily there is. We have um, a new rule. I know I saw some people try to apply this new rule in previous chapters, but we can't use rules until we get them in the textbook. But our new rule is called the Hospitals Rule. And it's someone's name, so that H needs to be a capital. Okay, so from this point forth, we are now allowed to use the Hospitals rule. And this is what it says. So let's introduce two functions. Suppose f and g are differentiable. And g prime of x, the derivative of g is equal to zero. on an open interval excuse me not equal to x to zero um, on an open interval i that contains a okay so we're just setting up the conditions of taking a limit so an open interval i that contains a and remember with limits we don't care about what happens at a so we can say except possibly at a and this just mimics the, the language that we use for limits okay so um in addition Let's also suppose, so first we have these two differential functions, the derivative of g is not zero, and we're gonna suppose that one of two things happens. The limit as x approaches a of the f function is zero, and the limit as x approaches a of g is also zero. Okay, alternatively, so I'll put an or here, or the limits are at infinity. And it could be plus or minus infinity. Okay, so essentially this is setting us up to have an indeterminate form. So we are setting the scene for an indeterminate form. Okay, so here we go. So if we are able to satisfy those things, um, then we have the following. So this is L'Hopital's rule now. Then the limit as x approaches a of this rational expression we've manufactured is equal to The limit as x approaches a of that same rational expression, but we're going to take the derivative of the top and the derivative of the bottom. Okay, um, and of course, this is assuming that the right hand side exists. So, you know, assuming this limit exists. Um, or is plus or minus infinity. So essentially we're saying, you know, the right and the left hand limits exist, or excuse me, are equal. Okay, so um, we're not gonna do a formal proof of this, but I'm gonna do just kind of a quick sketch so we can kind of see why this is true, because this is a crazy result, right? We're saying that if we have a rational expression and we're trying to find the limit, um, and we're not able to find the limit because we have an indeterminate form like zero over zero, something like that, we can just simply take the derivative of the top and the derivative of the bottom and then use that limit and it's the same. So kind of a crazy result. So let's do a quick sketch. We're gonna do 
just one of the cases for the quick sketch when we have the indeterminate form 0 over 0. And then let's create that scenario. So that means at A, both um, F and G have to be 0. So we're going to have two functions, you know, whatever kind of functions that are going to be crossing A um, at the x-axis, so it's going to be 0. So we'll say that's your f function, and then we'll say, you know, this could be G, something like that. Okay? All right, so that's the scenario. So if we are taking, we can see at the point A, f is 0 and G is 0, which is why we're getting this zero, the indeterminate form 0 over 0, okay? So what we're going to do, we're going to focus on those derivatives, right? So at A, um, remember derivative is slope of the tangent. So let's draw some tangent lines. We can draw that tangent line for F. And at A, let's draw another tangent line. We can draw that one there at G. Um, and if we are going to... Let's write an equation. Let's say this slope for the tangent line to f is m1. The tangent line for g is m2. OK? And now we have, they're both at this point a comma 0. OK, so we're going to be plugging in our points using this, right? So y, since y1 is 0, this is going to be the equation of those tangents. So the tangent line at f, the equation is going to be y equals, we said the slope was m1 times x minus a, and the tangent line of g will be y equals m2 x minus a. All right, and again, m1 and m2 is the slope of those tangents at that point. Okay, so... Um, Intuitively, essentially what's happening is we're saying um, the limit, as we're getting really, really, really close to A, a small open interval around A, right? And the smaller that interval is, as we zoom in on this picture, and we've seen this before um, with linear approximation, the tangent line um, of F and F, the actual curve F, um, they almost become identical. If we zoom in at that point A, the tangent line is, go is going to look exactly like the curve. Okay, and likewise, we can say the same thing with G. So around A, when we're taking the limit, intuitively, we could say, well, it's going to look like that slope. It's going to look like the slope of, of G. So let's write that out. So we have this limit as X approaches A of f over g, it's 0 over 0 in this case. And then we're saying that the function f, I'll write it in a different color, my tangent color is yellow. So the function of f is going to look like y equals m1 over x minus a. It's going to look like that tangent line. g is going to look like m2 times x minus a. Right? If we zoom in, and again, that's what linear approximation is all about. The tangent line and the curve kind of become one and the same around small intervals um, surrounding A. And look what just happened. We can cancel out the x minus A. We're left with m1 over m2. Um, and m1, isn't this just the derivative at A? And m2? Isn't this just the derivative of g at a? That's what the slope of the tangent is. So we do have this m1 over m2. And those are just the derivatives at a. So since um, f and g are differentiable, we can just rewrite it like the limit as x approaches a as f prime of x over g prime of x. Okay, and then again, this limit is that's going to equal f prime of a over f prime of b. Whoops. 
Let's try that denominator again. G prime of A. There you go. Okay, so that's um, that's kind of our basic visual proof of why L'Hopital's rule works. So again, we started with this. Um, we showed that that was equal to M1 over M2. And then M1 over M2 is equal to this expression. Okay, so that's your um, visual proof. It's not a formal proof, but it's it's good for our case. Okay, so um, just a quick note. We define L'Hopital's rule as x approaches a, but it also works for one-sided limits as well. Okay, and it also works for limits at infinity. That's when x is approaching infinity or negative infinity. Okay. So with Lyopatal's rule, we have yet another way we can prove that the limit as x approaches 0 of sine of x over x is equal to 1. Um, according to Lyopatal's rule, we can take the derivative of the top and bottom. Let me add in this extra step just because it's the first time doing it. All right, and then the derivative of sine is cosine and the derivative of x is one. All right, and then we plug in that zero. Cosine of zero is one. One divided by one is one. Okay, so we have yet another proof of showing that this limit is equal to one. Um, let's also bring back that example that we weren't able to do any algebraic manipulation to. So we had the limit as x approaches two of the natural log of two x minus three over x minus two. Okay, and um, we saw that the indeterminate form happens when we plug in two, we get zero over zero. All right, and actually let me write that as a little note. Um, your first step in evaluating limits Uh, should be to plug in that A. Because um, we've seen examples where we can just plug in the A and it's a continuous function at that point and we're just, you know, on our way. So first steps for evaluating, or first step for evaluating limits should always be just to plug in A. And that will at least give us some information of how we should approach the problem. All right, remember the A comes from um, where X is going. X is approaching A. All right, and we already know it's zero over zero. So now, since it's zero over zero, and since the functions are differentiable, we can use the hospital's rule. Okay, remember we can only use it if it's zero over zero or um, infinity over infinity. Okay, so according to the rule, this is equal to, the original limit is equal to the derivative of the numerator and denominator. So the derivative of natural log of 2x minus 3, we're going to have to use the chain rule. So 1 over 2x minus 3 times the derivative of the inside function, which is just 2, over the derivative of the bottom, which is just 1. Okay, so uh, we're going to want to take the limit, whoops, extra equal sign, as x approaches 2 of 2 over 2x minus 3. All right, and now that's continuous at 2, so let's go ahead and plug in x equals 2. 
which is four. So four minus three is one in the bottom, two in the top. So two divided by one is two. All right, so now we're able to evaluate these more complicated limits. So let's go ahead and practice. I'm gonna give you guys um, two limits to evaluate. You guys can push pause and try them out on your own. I'll give you two. The first one is the limit as x approaches infinity. Remember, we can still use L'Hopital's rule for um, limits at infinity and one-sided limits. Okay, and then you guys are also going to look at the limit as t approaches zero of 8t minus 5t divided by t. All right, and actually, I'm going to try to squeeze in a third one. Let's do the limit as x goes to zero of the tangent of 3x over sine of 2x. Okay, so go ahead and push pause and we'll see how you do. Okay, so again, the first step should be to plug in everything. And let's see, if we plug in infinity, definitely x squared goes to positive infinity. The natural logarithm, let's see, square root of infinity would be infinity. And then the natural logarithm um, at infinity is also infinity. Okay, remember you can always um, look at graphs to help you. This is the graph of root x. And then the graph of the natural logarithm looks like this. All right, so we can always use graphs to help us evaluate these limits. We have that indeterminate form. So our next step would be to take the derivative of the numerator. All right, so it's the chain rule. So this is gonna be one over root x. And then let's take the derivative of the inside. All right, that's x to the one half. So we're gonna bring down that exponent. And then the new exponent, x to the one half minus one is x to the negative one half. So we're gonna put that down below. All right, and then that's that. And we can clean that up a little bit. So you guys said then that this was, let's see, one over root x times root x is just x. All right. And then in the bottom, the derivative of x squared is 2x. We have 2x right there. And then let's, let's clean this up a little bit more. Um, let's see, dividing by 2x is like multiplying by 1 over 2x. Alternatively, we can just clear the fraction by multiplying top and bottom by 2x, however you want to look at it. But you should end up with 1 over 4x squared. Okay, and now we're ready to plug in. Um, as x goes to infinity, 4x squared is also going to go to infinity, it's going to be a very large number. Um, and one divided by a large number, infinity, is going to go to zero. All right, so number one, we're looking at zero. All right. Let's look at number two. So number two, um, again, your first step should always be to plug in t or what t is approaching, and we're gonna get eight to the zero minus five to the zero over zero. Eight, anything to raise to the zero power is one. So we're gonna get one minus one, zero over zero, which is the indeterminate form. So that tells us since it's an indeterminate form, um, we are going to use, let me get a different color. We're gonna use Leopatal's rule. Okay, so we're going to take the derivative of the top, and then we're going to take the derivative of the bottom. All right, so here we go. So um, derivative of the top, taking um, 
this is your exponential functions. Our base is not e, it's 8. So it's 8t, but then we have to take the natural log of 8. And then minus 5t times the natural log of 5. And then we're going to divide that by the derivative of t, which is just 1. Okay? All right, so now let's go ahead and plug in t equals 0 to take the limit. So once we plug in t equals 0, um, we can get rid of the limit sign. Um, and again, same rules apply as from chapters um, 2, right? You, we need the limit. It's all about communication, especially on exams, right? You have to tell me you're taking the limit, and once you take the limit, the limit sign goes away. Um, and what happens? We get 8 to the 0, which is just 1, minus 5 to the 0, which is just 1, right? and then divided by 1. So we're looking at um, natural log of 8 is what's left over minus natural log of 5. And you can leave it like that. If you wanted to, you know, combine it using limit laws, that's fine too. You can call it 8 over 5. All right, so I got cut off there for a little bit. Um, but it simplifies natural log minus natural log of 5, natural log of 8 minus natural log of 5. So you guys can submit this answer, or you could submit this just combining using your logarithm rules. All right, and then finally, you guys were looking at this, the limit of um, as x goes to 0 of tangent 3x over sine of 2x. And again, your first step should always be plug in those zeros, or that a. And tan of 0 is 0, and sine of 0 is 0. So we have the indeterminate form. So that tells us we're allowed to use Lyapunov's rule. And that rule tells us that that limit is the same limit, but we can take the derivative of the top. We need the chain rule, so derivative of tangent is secant squared. And we'll keep the inside function the same. And then times the derivative of the inside function, which is 3. I'm just going to move it to the front. And same thing with the bottom. We need the chain rule. So the derivative of sine is cosine times 2 of, excuse me, of 2x. And then the derivative of 2x is 2. All right. And then um, let's try plugging in that 0. So we're going to get 3 secant squared. 3 times 0 is 0. And again, remember, we need the limit sign to let us know we're taking the limit. And then once we plug in that zero, we no longer need the limit sign. All right, and remember, um, cosine of zero is one. Cosine of zero is one. So secant squared, which is one over cosine squared, it's going to be one. So the secant of zero is one. So the secant squared of zero is still one. And then the cosine of zero is also one. So we're looking at three halves. The limit is 3 halves. Okay, good. A little practice on our own. I want to show you another case that we didn't run into in our examples we just tried out. Um, consider the following. Whoops, excuse me. Um, the limit as x goes to 0 of x squared over 1 minus cosine x. All right, and notice if we were to plug in the x, we would get 0 in the top, and then 1 minus cosine of 0 is 1. So we get that indeterminate form 0 over 0. So according to Opatal's rule, we can take the derivative of the numerator, and we can take the derivative of the denominator. So let's see, the denominator is negative, negative sine of x, minus minus becomes plus. Okay, and now we're ready to find that limit again. But notice if we were to plug in the zero, what happens? Zero on the top, sine of zero is zero. So we're still getting the indeterminate form. So guess what we have to do? We have to use the rule twice. Okay, so as long as we're getting an indeterminate form, um, we can keep going. We can do this over and over again. All right, so now the derivative of the top is 2, 
derivative of the bottom is cosine of x. Okay, and now we can plug in the zero and we won't get an indeterminate form, mainly because we have a constant in the numerator. We know we're good to go. And then cosine of zero again is one. So we're looking at two this time. All right, so um, that's your Leopoldal's rule. Uh, what we're going to look at next is something called an indeterminate product. And an indeterminate product is when we have something like when we take a limit and we end up with zero times infinity. Okay, so um, it's hard to say what this is. Like when we're taking the limit, does, do we go faster towards zero, so the whole product's zero? Do we go faster towards infinity, so the whole product's infinity? We don't know, okay? Um, just a little thought bubble. When we are looking at um, infinite limits, we are allowed to take the product of two infinite limits. For instance, infinity times negative infinity, we saw as negative infinity, right? Or if we look at infinity times infinity, that's also infinity, right? Or if we have two negatives, that's positive, stuff like that. But this is different. This is zero times infinity, okay? So this one's okay to do like we've been doing. We don't know how to evaluate these indeterminate products. So let's look at an example and we'll talk about our strategy. Okay, sorry about that. I pushed the wrong button. All right, so let's talk about our strategy. Let's consider this limit. X to the 3 halves times sine of 1 over X. And notice if we were to plug in infinity, um, infinity to the 3 halves is still infinity. And then 1 over infinity is 0, right? 1 over infinity is 0. We can also always sketch out the graph as well. And then sine of 0 is 0, okay? So we have an indeterminate product. So what we want to do, we want to manipulate this so we can use Leopoldal's rule. And so what we're going to do, our strategy, is to take this indeterminate product, all right, and I'll write it down here. This is an indeterminate, very long word, indeterminate product, and we're going to create just um, an indeterminate form, like zero over zero. So how we're gonna do that is we're gonna create a fraction. And it's equivalent. So we're going to think of this as f divided by 1 over g. And notice, you know, this is the same. And can you say, see why? We're going to take f of 1 over g. If we multiply, for instance, both the top and the bottom by g to clear that denominator, we would get f times g. So they're equivalent. And why we do that is now, once it's in an indeterminate form, we can use Leopoldal's rule and evaluate the limit. Okay, so um, let's do this. Let's bring this down here. And we're looking at the limit as x goes to infinity. Um, let's see, I'm gonna leave, it, and it doesn't matter which one you leave on the top. Sometimes it's a little bit easier. One method is a little bit easier than the other. But I'm gonna leave sine of one over x on the top. And how could I bring x to the 3 halves, how can I bring that downstairs without, exchange, it, without changing the expression? Well, when we send something upstairs and downstairs, that's just manipulating that exponent to be positive or negative. So I'm just going to look at this as negative 3 halves. And I haven't changed anything. Okay, and notice now when we plug in the infinity, 
Here, I'll write it like that. It's a little bit easier to see. Perhaps if we write it without the negative exponent. Okay, and now one over X, we have one over infinities, which, which are zeros. So we have sine of zero in the top. And then one over infinity, one over zero, we have an indeterminate form. So now with that little change, we can use Leopold's rule. Okay, so we can take the derivative of the top. We need the chain rule. Okay, so that's like x to the negative 1. So bring down the negative sign, and the new exponent becomes negative 2. So something like that. And then I like drawing thing or writing things out without the negative exponent since I know we're going to infinity. It's a little bit easier for me to see. And then over yonder, bring that exponent down, subtract 1 from negative 3 halves. So we're going negative 5 halves. I'm going to do a little bit more manipulating, okay? So for instance, I'm going to. I'm just going to clean this up is essentially what I'm doing. So I'm going to multiply top and bottom by x squared to clear the denominator. Okay, otherwise it's going to get crazy when we when we um, plug in that infinity. If we don't clean this up, it's going to be really hard to keep track of everything. Um, that's going to cancel with that x squared. I also notice, look at we have a minus minus. Those two negative factors will cancel out to be positive. Let's see what we have. We have cosine of 1 over x in the top. 3 halves in the bottom. Ugh, we can clean that up too. Let's go back. Let's also multiply top and bottom by 2. So we can get rid of that denominator in the bottom. And then we'll be left with a 2 in the top. All right. And now we have x to the negative 5 halves times x squared. Okay, and we still have the 3 there as well. But when we're multiplying the same base, remember we can add up the exponents. So negative 5 halves plus 2, right? Negative 5 halves plus, I'm going to write 2 as 4 over 2. So negative 5 plus 4 is negative 1 half. Okay, and again, you know. 2 becomes 4 over 2. Okay, so when we add our stack, we need the same denominator. Okay. All right. So one last thing we can do. What do we do with negative exponents? Since this is downstairs, we can send it upstairs. And then I think we're almost done simplifying. So we're going to bring this up. x to the 1 half. I'm just going to write it like this, square root of x. And now all that's left in the denominator is 3. Can you believe it? All right, and now we're ready to take our limit at infinity. Okay, so let's plug it in. Um, we're going to get 2 times square root of infinity, which will just be infinity, um, times cosine of 1 over infinity. Remember what 1 over infinity is? 1 over infinity is 0 and then over 3. All right, so um, cosine of 0 is 1. So we're looking at 2 times infinity times 1, which is a fit infinity, right? Divided by 3. Infinity divided by 3 is, is still infinity, right? Because we can just keep getting larger and larger and larger. All right, so in that situation, our indeterminate form was infinity times zero, and it turns out the infinity grew faster, right? It was more dominant, if you will. So that's what the actual limit was. It was infinity. All right, so um, you guys are going to try one. You're going to be given an indeterminate product. You're going to turn it into an indeterminate form, so you're going to manipulate it into a fraction, and then you're going to use your Lua-Pitals rule. All right, so here you go. So go ahead and push pause. You're going to take the limit as x goes to infinity of x times sine of pi over x. All 
Okay, so your first step is always to see what happens when you plug in A. So X is infinity, sine of pi over infinity, pi over infinity is zero, and then sine of zero is zero. So we have an indeterminate product. All right, so um, we have different ways of doing this, um, but remember essentially we were, we're gonna wanna take F over G and turn it into a fraction somehow. Right, and we can do it, you know, either g divided by one over f, or we could do it f divided by one over g. Okay, it doesn't matter. Um, we should all end up with the same solution. I'm gonna go for, where are we, infinity? I'm gonna keep the sign up here, because why not? And I'm gonna send x downstairs, and I'm going to write it as 1 over x, something like that, okay? Um, or, you know, alternatively, I'll write it in a different pen color. Perhaps you kept the x on top, and you sent the sign downstairs. And then if you sent sign downstairs, it would be 1 over sign, which is just the cosecant. All right, so we have, we have some options. And they should, they should be the same. So I'm going to write the word or in here, and, and we'll see that they're the same. All right, so notice if we were to plug in infinity, uh, we would get the 0 over 0. We would get, well, we would get 0 over 0 here. And then over yonder, we would get infinity over infinity. Okay, so here we go. Let's take the... Derivative of the top, and it's going to be the chain rule. Okay, so the derivative of you know one over x is again is negative one over x squared. That one happens a lot. Um, so hopefully you all feel comfortable with that. So again, bring down that negative sign and then subtract one. So it's gonna end up being negative one, x to the negative two. So negative one over x squared. Okay. And then what do we do? Let's plug in the infinity sign. So cosine, so pi over infinity, is again zero. Oh, actually, you know what? I'm not gonna do that. I'm first, I wanna clean this up. All right, so I'm gonna multiply, because look, we have denominators over denominators. I wasn't focused. See what happens when you don't focus? In calculus, you always gotta stay focused. Okay, so we have all these nice cancellations. That's actually quite beneficial. And here I was gonna try to plug in infinity right off the bat, that would have made my life hard. Now my life just got a little bit easier. So this whole thing simplified to limit as x approaches infinity. Let's see, we have pi left in the top um, times cosine of pi over x. Okay, and now if we plug in the infinity and we take that limit, pi over infinity again is zero and cosine of zero is one. So our, our solution this time is pi. Okay, and there you go. All right. What's next? The next thing we're going to look at is something called indeterminate differences. We're going to look at indeterminate differences. Um, but we're going to do that in part two. So let's, uh, let's go ahead and see each other over. In part two, where we're going to talk about indeterminate differences.